Good morning, everybody. Woke up very early this morning, and I'm probably going to be up late tonight. <laughs> and uh, I'm up early, 4 o'clock in the morning. I get up, watch Nagelwasser, say Berkers of Torah. What does he do? You learn Gemara, you learn Torah. Baruch Hashem, you know, every day I learn a certain amount. And I'm stuck to it, Baruch Hashem, more or less. Make it up if I miss something, but I don't have to do that too often. And I was thinking to myself, well, now I'm going to have time because I got all my learning that I would usually do when I'm driving to make a video. What am I going to make a video about, though? Yesterday I had an interesting topic about how you know, in Verms, if someone was appointed as a Parnes, I don't know if the whole video got even recorded, because I know some of it got corrupted, we tried to get it back, I think part of it we lost, so I might have to record it again, but I don't really have time to go back and listen and find out what I missed and everything, but basically it was a fascinating piece of information that to be a Parnes, to be a member of the Jewish Community Council in Germany in those days, you had to be sworn in in the in, in the court of the bishop or the cardinal, you know, and they were, and the deacon would come and, and read from a sefer galachus, from a book of uh, a galach's book, to uh, to talk about you know what uh, you know to to impart an oath upon anyone who was a member of the Jewish Community Council fascinating, fascinating piece of his history, and showing the, even though obviously, again, like we said, that, you know, the, the Jewish community had lower hand, which we're in Gaulis, that's where we're supposed to be, until Mashiach comes, until the Messiah comes, we're in exile, and we're supposed to have the lower hand, we're not supposed to have the upper hand. Uh, but how it was a mutual respect that there was there, and that the Jewish people, when they were sworn in to such a position, they would wear their big day Yom Tov, they would wear their, their holiday garb, their nicest clothing, and the, and the whole ceremony and how the Jew would take a Chumash and, and open it up to the Ten Commandments. A fascinating, fascinating piece of history there that I had no idea about until I read about the Shabbos and, and the in the safer of the Minhagim of Kal Kadosh Ramiza. But, uh, so we spoke about that yesterday, and I, that was the main thing that I wanted to bring out yesterday, and I don't know if I got it to the second video or anything. But then I was like, so, all right, I did my learning. I was going to wait until it's daylight to say Tehillim and Tanakh, so that I did while I was driving. So now here I am, and once I was done learning, all right, I went to look at the at the social media to, to hop around a little bit, especially if there was something to talk about, uh, to learn, to know about from a, a Jewish perspective as well. And since I'm a child, since I'm a teenager. I've been listening to Rabbi Yehuda Levin. I met him a few times, and I'm always a fan of his his brash style, he, he, he no nonsense, and his uh, commitment to authentic Torah values. And he had where to go from, you know. He's not. You know, he's not a Yaron Ruvain who got from 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 Yossi Mizrahi, a nobody who got from a nobody. You know, if you want to say that Rabbi Yehuda Levin is, is a shtickle, maybe a nobody, which I would not say, he's a Talmud Chochem, he's an Erlich Higid. And he got from Rabbi Victor Miller, he got from somebody. You know, and so uh, anything that he had with his style and his way that he has... He got from from the Gadol Ador from Rabbi Victor Miller. 
and 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 so therefore his his no nonsense, his fearless approach, and everything. It comes from a Masora. It doesn't come out of out of a vacuum. And so, and it and it comes with with a cheshbon. You know, he doesn't he doesn't just let his mouth run the way I do. I, he thinks about what he's saying, and, and he has it. He has he, everything is calculated. And Rabbi Levin, Zulgazunzain, he has many, many uh, podcasts and different things. And here I am doing silly podcasts about about movies and about or or about serious issues about criminal justice reform and things like that. And. Um, Rabbi Levin, he talks about drama oimdim al rumah shaloylam, varam oimdim al aperek. Talks about very important things, things that are at the, you know, very lofty, heavenly matters, matters that are of, of earthly importance, things that are that most people ignore. And it was a wake up call for me to listen because I hadn't listened to him in a while. I also read an article from, I don't know, it was the Daily Wire, or it was, maybe it was another website. It also was a wake-up call. And... It's a difficult world that we live in. And I'll talk about my own journey that perhaps I have to reflect upon and wake up about. So in 2016, in primary, I voted for Ted Cruz. And I told myself, and I said it on this channel, that in the general election, the only reason why I voted for, for Donald Trump was because he was running against Hillary Clinton. And I said, even I said, if it would have been Donald Trump against Bernie Sanders, I would have probably voted third party because it, it, there wasn't a clear lesser of two evils there. Because I didn't know, you know, who Donald Trump was, you know. I very much agreed with what Ted Cruz said about Donald Trump's New York values. As a New Yorker, I wanted those Texas values. I didn't want the New York values. And people made it about... September 11th, it had nothing to do with September 11th, it had to do with Greenwich Village, you know, and and so I was on Ted Cruz's side about that, but nonetheless, I voted for this man that I felt was too liberal, Donald Trump gave him the chance, and he proved himself worthy of, you know, as I saw it, worthy of, of being President of the United States. When he, be, when he got up as inauguration, he said, this is not merely the transference of the power from one party to another, from one administration to another, but it's a return of the power to the people. That inspired me tremendously. And I felt, well, this is going to be okay. This isn't going. This isn't Bidiyev, This isn't, you know, post facto something that we really don't want, but we'll have to do with the best we can because we, we can't have Hillary Clinton, who 
was pure evil. This was this was what we were what we've been waiting for, and it was. However, nonetheless, Donald Trump was and is a liberal. And we have to ask ourselves, to what point, one of the commentators here was, uh, one of the, on, on the channel, was discussing this question. The difference between classical liberalism and libertarianism and authoritarianism, and which is better... He was arguing uh, an alt-right position about abortion, about eugenics. He was really arguing a Nazi position. Um, this this author, well, I don't know who he is, but I'm saying the argument that he was making was was fascistic and 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 bordered on Nazistic. I don't think that's a word. Might as well put up my pace anyway. I'm almost to work. Uh, Nazi-esque, I guess would be the word. So... question is, though, how far do we take it? And so Rabbi Levin, the reason why I listened to this podcast, I didn't listen to the whole thing, but I knew it was a, an hour-long podcast, and I, list, and I tuned in maybe 20 minutes in, because he listed there what, what he's talking about. I don't do that type of stuff. I just talk. I don't really plan ahead very much what I'm going to talk about. I just make these videos. Although I realized I have to keep them down to a certain amount or else they get chopped up. And I, um, it's better I chop it up than it just gets chopped up by itself. But he mentioned he played a recording from a shear that my Rebbe from high school, Ramosha Weinberger, who I know at least when I brought him up in high school was not a fan of Rabbi Levin. Um... I think he felt it to be too simplistic, too black and white. But what exactly is going on here? What are we talking about? What you know? I I, I noticed, for example, another person, Rabbi Weinberger, did not have too many nice things to say. Although when I spoke to him about him, he he had respect for him. Rabbi Ariel Bar Tzadok, I noticed he is changing his tune. It's becoming much less classically liberal than he has been. Not providing a platform for messianics anymore. What she was open to in the interest of, you know, extending an olive branch, he's kind of given that up and said, you know, Jews be Jews and Christians be Christians, and neither the twain shall meet. And we can respect, like we spoke about, you know, the how the the, the, the bishop would would have the. Uh, in his court and have the deacon administer an oath an oath of office to, to members of Jewish community councils in Germany that was the classical way in which things were done and that was because there was no separation of church and state and so therefore this was originally a position 
that the king or some nobleman, some secular political leader would engage in, and then it became a religious function. So, That being said, you know, I, I mean, I've heard, you know, Jews from South Africa tell me they prefer the manner in which it is done in countries like South Africa, countries like Germany, countries like Israel, where you have a chief rabbi and you have, and, and the chief rabbi has authority political authority and that ensures that you don't have reform and conservative right everything is under the auspices of the orthodox chief rabbi and so it ensures that things are done the right way thing is, is, to me, as a right-wing classical liberal, well, I want to know, is it, is that the right way? Meaning, you know, I, uh, in Israel, I, I would be on the side of of the Eidah Haredes, right? Of the anti-Zionist, ultra-Orthodox community when it comes to a great deal of issues. Not everything. But certainly when it comes to Zionism, those are my people. You know, that's where I feel comfortable. You know, I don't, I, I don't see something that... I, and why? And because it's totally independent. It's not under the thumb of the government. It's a pure, unadulterated, authentic Torah Judaism. And that's why, you know, I, I think on, uh, on Facebook, they ask me, what are your political views? Right? That's one of the categories, and I wrote Glenn Beck for America and Amram Blau for Israel. And, and I still am Glenn Beck for America and Amram Blau for Israel, and both of these represent a, a type of a classical liberalism, a type of a radical classical liberalism that says if I want to be as religious as I want to be, you know, but it, it, I need to let, have the government let people be as secular or liberal or irreligious as they want to be. And a kind of, as the Christians would say, live and let live type of ideology. Now that's not what the Torah has as an ideal. But it's what has existed, and certainly for us in Golos, has worked for us is a kind of live and let live attitude. And that is kind of really essentially what Donald Trump was pushing as president. I've I made public statements that Donald Trump the most pro-gay president in history. First president to enter the White House not opposing uh, the what I will call the redefinition of marriage. And as opposed to Joe Biden who has a long history of opposing that. And, and Alright, now it's not popular anymore because he 
he, he, he goes whichever way the wind go, blows, you know. And now the, the wind is blowing him to uh, just destroy everything, basically. It's, it's not really antinomian, but it's... Nor is it anarchic, but it's destructive. It's, it's you know, tearing everything down in order to quote unquote build back better which means really to have totalitarianism but also President Trump was the most pro-life president really in history since you know as far back as any of these two issues have been issues And that's consistent because it's a live and let live attitude. It's a classically liberal attitude. It's a libertarian attitude. The question is now I'm starting to get tired, but I want to try to fast half the day. You know, it's interesting. Yesterday we fasted to remember the, the writing of the Septuagint, and I realized it's not just that it's a book on the shelf. It's that it takes away the need for a teacher. 